It's fantastic to have Lola here with me today. Uh, Lola, CMO advisor at her company, Baco, author of an upcoming book, Responsible Marketing, Adweek Creative 100 2023. I mean, the list goes on when we look at your profile, Lola. You're very welcome here today to our 40 Courses Q&A. Please introduce yourself to all of our attendees. Thank you so much. Well, Louise, the first thing I have to say is it was a pleasure to meet you in real life this year at Ken, and it's wonderful to have a second touch point now virtually. I feel just as close as if we were standing there together. Um, so by way of introduction, you know, I am a marketing consultant. I started in the CPG world out of undergrad um, on the Gatorade brand at PepsiCo Chicago. That was kind of like a a fortuitous leap into a place where I got to learn from some of the top MBAs who are now top CMOs, like Morgan Flatley. She was an AMM when I was there figuring out how to use Excel. So I, I had the unique um, sort of hybrid experience of being a liberal arts, arts major who then fell in love with the connection of art and science that that marketing uniquely has the ability to produce. And so went back and got my MBA and have been on this ongoing journey of wanting to fuse the two disciplines. Um, so responsible marketing very organically became the thing that I started talking and thinking about a lot in the last number of years. We all know things happened in 2020. We don't need to necessarily go there. But even before when we had people like John Mackey writing about conscious capitalism and conscious leadership, and is there a different way of producing outside outsized business results than just having fun? Can we solve problems and also grow the business and maybe even grow it more because there's that emotional connection? So that that sort of passion for that thinking led me to pretty much read everything and talk to everyone. <laughs> and conversations like these are a huge part of that. Um, so yeah, that by way of introduction, that's kind of how I got into all this. And I'm excited to answer any questions you want to start with. Uh, Louise, and, the, and then of course from the group, um, and I'm happy to share from a couple of the materials that are yet to be published in the book coming out as well. Fantastic. Great introduction, Lola. Thank you so much. And I suppose the first direction I'd like to go in is when I came across you to, on LinkedIn, I think it was probably back in 2023 when you were maybe going to be on the jury at links does that sound right yes yeah yes. i think that's when we first connected and i saw oh, you were wow. writing about this subject responsible marketing and i suppose it just beggars the question straight away my initial reaction was like you know what exactly does this mean you know marketing in a very simplistic way it's about selling and what is this paradox? You know, we've been down this line of particularly in Cannes, we had sort of the year of purpose. Everyone seemed to get a bit sick of that. Uh, and where are we now? What is what is this message that you're now uh, trying to convey? How can we be a responsible marketer? What is it exactly? I love this question because it takes me back to exactly what you just said. The money part is a prerequisite. Right. So when I when I set up my LinkedIn post about this event, responsible marketing is not philanthropy. I mean that 100 percent. What we are doing is being responsive to the cultural context of what's going on around us and what's motivating consumers and what they're struggling with and what they need guidance right? Like what they want to believe in that maybe they don't, they need encouragement to bridge that gap. And that's what art has always done. But marketing in moments of, of sort of growth and tension and evolution, like the one we're in now, and they, you know, there've been plenty. I'm just, you know, the newest, the people who've been doing this since the sixties have done all this already. And I've spoken to a lot of people who are saying, thanks for being like this generation's me, but we've been we, this ebbs and flows all of the time. Um, so, you know, we can take the power of that emotion and turn it in to business results if we select for the right things. And that's the key. There's this perception out there that either you do commercial marketing, some people call it performance marketing. I don't. Um, or you do brand long-term equity building marketing. You choose one and one has immediate results 
and the other may have long-term results? Well, that depends on a lot. And it primarily depends on whether each of those things was done well or was optimized for the result that was wanted, right? So tactics are never gonna lead us to the strategy, but if we think about the strategy and deploy the tactics, that's sort of where responsible marketing becomes something that is a very powerful business tool. I mean, Silicon Valley has been doing the same thing for decades. And we, you know, with our large Fortune 500 or enterprise marketing budgets have exactly the same opportunity. And of course, you can't talk about responsible marketing without including its sort of little sister, inclusive marketing. I mean, they both come together. But as you rightly pointed out uh, in my little title for this talk, without the cringe, uh, right. Right. what are we talking about without the cringe? So and I bad. think a lot of us know what the cringe is. You know, you watch a campaign and you're like, oh, my God, how did they get it so wrong? trying to be inclusive or trying to be purposeful, trying to be, you know, all these things that we have to meet, all these expectations. A lot of people just get it a bit wrong, don't they, Lola? Okay, so that's one answer. I actually want to hear from a couple other people in the group, because this is a great question. What, if you have that cringe reaction ever to these sorts of things, what is really at the core of driving the, like, uh, if you had to be brutally honest, so have we got any any comments from any of us here? When you see one of those awful ad campaigns and you're just like, oh, my God, how did they get it so wrong? Uh, how have so many people approved this and got it past the line? Uh, and, and it's and on our screen, so Lola. On something. What you just said applies to every kind of marketing there is. Think about it. We have those cringe reactions to things that we don't think will be effective, work that didn't succeed. But there's nothing particularly, um, you know, sort of positioned for that sort of failure when it comes to social impact and commercial impact intersected work. We are expecting that. And the expectation of that is where we really have to question how we rebuild our values so we don't think of it like that. Why would we be more upset about a purpose-driven ad that failed than we were about a Tom Brady Super Bowl ad that failed. We have to ask ourselves that question. Patrice and has put her hand up, and we'd love you to come in there if you've got a comment, Patrice. Please. Yeah, I'm, I'm agreeing with all of the sentiments that's being shared. And when I think about some of the, um, what I would call cringeworthy ads that I've seen, that's supposed to be led by purpose, but maybe they've been a little bit out of touch. I do think that there's a lot of sensationalism that's taken place. And I don't know that it's necessarily purpose driven. And I think that there's always this, um, I don't know what the sentiment is in, in terms of why companies do what they do. But I do think that there are, you know, maybe teams of individuals that maybe have purpose and philanthropy and marketing mixed up and they think it's one and the same when they're absolutely not. The willingness to engage is what is a derivative of that responsible marketing campaign that's put into place. And so I feel that there is a response to, you know, the crowd and this sensationalism of social media and what they think will be more popular, but it does not always align with the mission, vis vision, and values of the company that's, you know, really working to do it. And then there's that disconnect in the, the brand, you know, marketing team that's potentially working on that and, and who they're catering to. Are they catering to the purpose of the company um, and what the company really stands for and the problem that they're solving in society? Or are they really just trying to do what's trendy at the time? And so those are my two, two three, four, <laughs> five cents. Thanks. Patrice. Those are all of the sense that literally you just taught that part of the class because these are the things we need to unpack. Everything you said was spot on. I'm gonna, but I'm going to start at the, at the end and we're going to resolve how we can solve for transcending that performative. And that's what I'm really excited about. I'm, I'm not promoting the book. It's a list of four things that are all free on LinkedIn already. If you want to buy the book and read it there, would love that, but I'll share them with you now. And the way to ensure that a brand isn't being performative is if it's doing something to either create a real and long-term opportunity for the intended beneficiary 
if it's telling a real story that benefits that beneficiary more than the brand, or at least as much, if it solves a real problem for that historically excluded community. Perfect example, um, MasterCard's uh, true name, right? That solved a problem that people who are changing their name to be more their true name deal with at the point of sale that can actually lead to danger. It solved a problem for the community that has been ex excluded. It didn't just celebrate them. It helped them in a material way. And so when you start to think about opportunities to select for ways that you can grow your business by growing the business of a business that needs your help with growth, you get to things like PepsiCo's Dig In. Yes, there have been some conversations about execution and there always will be, but imagine the idea of helping a small business become a Pepsi poor and then they're a Pepsi poor forever. So that's where we start to think about it. Where, where can we find those moments where everybody is winning and focus there instead of saying, this stuff doesn't work because it's hokey. Well, it doesn't work <laughs> if you make it hokey. So I like that, Lola, the concept of solving a real problem. Do you think that's sort of one of the core questions that the marketing team need to take on board, sort of almost take a step back uh, and Absolutely. say, you know, what what is this we're we're trying to? It's like it's like the Kit Kat answer, isn't it? That it's so simple. It's just you know, have a break. <laughs> that, that's it. It's a snack a snack break. Is it just we have to really peel back and say, you know, what's the problem we're solving? I see what you're asking. Yeah. Well, yes and no. So if there is a higher level societal problem connected to something about the taking of a break, and I, I'm I'm not brainstorming right now, and this isn't it. <laughs> good idea, but it, I want to show you how fast you can find that connection. What happens when people don't take breaks? What are we doing in terms of, you know, encouraging people to be mindful and look at their call map? Could we combine that with chocolate? I'm going in a lot of places that don't necessarily connect, but when you, if you have a room of people thinking about that for a day who are way smarter than me, they could, if they wanted to choose that path. Now, the only reason to choose that path is if it creates the biggest outside outsized business result. So it's not about just finding responsible marketing things to do. It's making sure you're evaluating the emotional relationships that your underserved customers might need you to address. And, and it means, and this is, this is something I'm going to get a lot of discussion about, I know, because not everyone will agree, but what I see as a historically excluded community is a community that's been ex historically excluded. I have many intersectionally. I'm a, a first generation immigrant. I'm a black woman. I'm a plus size woman. I have natural hair. Um, I'm a middle child. Some people might go that far. Now I'm not saying that makes sense, but if there's a brand relevant connection point, find your historically excluded community and serve them. They don't even have to exist before you created them. Rihanna's shown that that uh, shown us that so beautifully. You know, she has people using makeup who never thought they could. So this idea that we are in a responsive and 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 I'll I'll you know kind of make fun of the name of the book a little bit here in a responsive posture to where the, we're pretty much just the order takers. And you know, since Steve Jobs has passed and he was the only guy could do it, the rest of us are just gonna tell ask them what they want and we'll and we'll make it and we'll make some money, like. We can't allow ourselves to be that base because we just have too much work to do. So if you have a choice between spending, you know, $2.5 million on an ad featuring, I'll, sorry, pick on Tom Brady again, and you could make the same return doing something that creates regenerative impact for an underserved community, which would you choose? And if you wouldn't choose the one that does more, but gives back the same, well, why? Why? And so that's the premise. So so Lola's referring to her book that's coming out in December, Responsible Marketing, How to Create an Authentic and Inclusive Marketing Strategy. And I suppose um, what you, you talked about, you know, the, the period of, of lockdown and you've said, you know, responsible marketing, it's not as if it is a new concept. But I think we are very much talking about 
how we see responsible marketing today very much with our focus on the environment. But right. what was it that, you know, what was it that sparked you off to think, I'm going to write a book about this? This is what I always find fascinating. What What's that thing where you're yeah. like, hold on, there's, there's, there's enough here for a book? I started with just needing to have my voice heard about, again, as everyone said, mm -hmm. how poorly the early 2020 Black Square mm -hmm. get into stuff was what I, I just I had to talk about it. So that turned into um, working with uh, my business coach, who I mentioned in the book, coming up with a program to kind of walk people through how they what we called it, then she named it maximize the movement. And I'm telling you guys like the real process, because I also want people to know how surprisingly easy it is to get a book deal I, and maybe edit that part out. <laughs> you know what I mean? If, you can. If, if you if you have something interesting to say, they, there is a need of content. Um, and so after making the LinkedIn top voice list, one of the acquisition editors and my amazing editor, Kogan Page, found me um, and I said yes. And there was no agent involved. And we turned it into something that everyone could understand. No one's going to Google maximize the movement and know what I'm talking about. But we all have a relationship with the word responsibility. And, it, and it's a deep and evocative one. It's really never a boring one. And, and we talk about this in the book. Responsible things are the things you do when no one's watching to define the essence of who you believe yourself to be. So it's really finding ways to bring that to life in your professional work. And there is no not enough or too much. It's just an awareness that this is possible um, that I think, you know, we can continue to inspire it and each other. And sort of going to the personal Lola now, rather than just talking about the general subject of marketing, you mentioned there that uh, you have been a, a LinkedIn voice and you do have the uh, sort of braveness to be very open, speak very openly. Uh, not everybody has that. Uh, well, just it depends. For every... <laughs> My mom would not agree. <laughs> <laughs> just for everybody who's here now, you know, if they're talking now about the personal, if they feel like they would like to establish themselves more as, as a voice, be it on the LinkedIn platform or be it anywhere, have you got any any tips there? We're all different, so the way we go about it will be different. I do. I, and exa that's exactly right. You never know where you're going to feel that, like, just connection with the place you're writing. I never felt it on Medium. I felt it on Twitter until all the stuff happened, and we won't talk about that. I never felt it on Threads. I just never felt it on Instagram because all of the pictures, I'm like, I, I can't process all of this. But <laughs> I felt it on LinkedIn, and... When I started to write consistently, that was a moment where I cared more about getting out my thoughts than what anyone would think about it or whether or not they would even read it. It started as more of like a live journal to try to figure out all this stuff that I was processing around this perhaps expanded discipline um, and what I wanted to learn from people on the front lines. Obviously, I can't consult with every CMO out there, but I can read about what he or she or they think every day and interact with them in the DMs, you'd be surprised how often they're just willing to talk because nobody approaches them. Um, so it just became this sort of, um, I don't know, it, it, it was a niche that manifested itself in a way that I, I couldn't have ever intended, um, but made me feel more lit up than anything I've ever done and pulled from all the parts of my educational background and also career background. I, I didn't say this, but I was head of marketing at the Daily Dot back when the editorial was very sharp at the Daily Dot because it was. Um, and I still love it that, you know, love it there. But, um, you know, we didn't have the right leadership sort of mesh to work together. Lola needed to be more in the background than was possible for that to work. And I understand that. Um, so we parted with, you know, loving ways. But, but that idea of helping to market ideas and publishing and thoughts and transcendence and belief has always resonated with me. Um, and so all this stuff is kind of doing that. Yeah, mm. we're seeing where it goes. Yeah. And so encouragement for everyone else. Sorry, let me get to that part. This is a very tactical piece of advice. Raise your hand if you have a group chat that you chat with like once every couple of days at least. 
<laughs> or once a week? And if not, could you make one? The things that I started to post on LinkedIn were the things that I was boring my group chat with saying. The things that fired me up so much that I had to write them somewhere. And so I just sort of shifted where I was writing out all of these thoughts that my friends who aren't marketers could care less about. <laughs> so if you think about it like that, like what gave you a reaction? What do you want to teach someone? What do you want to make sure someone knows? What did you just learn that you don't want to forget you just learned? Um, and who do you want to cheer on? That was a lot of it too. I probably didn't write consistently um, for a number of years before I was actually just re responding and reacting with people who were writing. Zoe Skamen comes to mind. I mean, I read her religiously and commented and learned from her before I even wrote much on LinkedIn. Um, so allowing yourself to study, allowing yourself to be at your own pace and really being honest with yourself about what you want because some people don't want attention. And so why would you go seeking it? You can do a great job as a CMO without being someone who enjoys attention. We see them all the time. So it's it's really about being yourself, but taking risks to find out what the most exciting version of yourself is. That's lovely, Laura. I mean, it's like the cliche, really, but it's being true to yourself. And then by mm -hmm. writing about what you're passionate about, what you're genuinely interested in, it's going to it's going to sort of show through. And, you know, it does when I read uh, read your post. There are obviously things that have really fired you up. <laughs> and I change my mind about them all the time. That's the best part. When people know that you're actually talking with them, you know, you're not talking at them. Those are my favorite moments. Like, you know, I hadn't thought about it like that. I used a slur, and I won't repeat it, but it... Um, refers to when Japanese people are sort of being, um, I don't know what what you would say, following the rules. And I and I and I use that in a way to say we shouldn't be doing this. We shouldn't be bowing down. I had no idea that was a slur. In the comments, someone comes in, Brr. wouldn't I rather learn it from him? You know, so it's it's all about the perception of what some people think are the negative sides of LinkedIn. If you want toxic positivity, I really hope that continues to grow in other places because we don't have time for that. That's really great, Lola. So uh, everybody who's joined us, as I said, you're all very welcome. It's great to have so many people along on this conversation. We're talking about responsible marketing. We're talking about inclusive marketing. If you've got any questions that you want to put to Lola, as we did earlier, please just put them in the chat box and we'll bring you in. Um, Chris, who's with us, our CEO, hi, Chris, has put a couple of uh, uh, questions in there. I'd love to bring you in, if you don't mind, Chris, to put a couple of those questions to Lola, if you wouldn't mind. Sure, yes. hi. Here we are, here's Chris. Uh, yeah, I can't remember what I asked now, I have to scroll well, back Chris. up. Um, <laughs> yeah, I was saying, uh, oh, I just I just thought the first one I was gonna ask was, um, are there, are there any companies that you think are doing this very well right now? Oh, yes. Um, and, and what are they? <laughs> yeah, and I love, this is, of course, I should have known. Excellent question because it allows me to make the most important point. There isn't a single company that is doing this well all the time everywhere. Like I, for, Fortune 500, Inc., whatever list you want to go to, your local neighborhood, it's just not real that anybody could do any of this stuff perfectly or frankly, really anything. So that question in and of itself is often used in a way to sort of divert from the conversation because if we really ask ourselves that question, it's not a different question than we would ask about anything, right? So now where it's going well are where the results are achieved. So, for example, um, ELF, I'm sure you all saw recently the amazing sort of like boardroom, this many people are named Fred, we need more women in the boardroom type of thing. That campaign they did, it was all over, um, uh, you know, places adjacent to Wall Street, I think, and subways in New York. They actually moved the needle with a cohort of women 
that have the money to buy in department store, but hadn't been engaged in sort of C-store makeup. Just by galvanizing that message. You could read Corey's LinkedIn, but I'm not, I'm not making this up. She talks about it all the time. And I love that example because it's it takes bravery to even think that connection might be made. But that is it, that's what it is to build brand equity. And when you're lucky, you can reap the rewards of it in real time. Way better than some Google search ad. Sorry. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. Thanks. I am um, I mean, I I I was wondering, I guess it's sort of I was maybe answering my own question. I was about to say, I wonder how you can tell when it's been genuine or whether it's it's sort of a form of greenwashing or purpose yes. rushing or whatever. And I I guess then it takes it kind of relates to what you just said there. It's it, the company itself has to then follow up with what they've said. So here are the results of this thing that we have done, which which then shows that you're not greenwashing or purpose washing or anything. Uh, Absolutely right. And if you start to think about it the way you would evaluate any program that you propose right. in the beginning of the year, right? Like, did it achieve its metrics? Did it lift brand reputation? Did it outperform its revenue goals? Did it outperform its profitability goals? Like, these are the, they're, they're, they're the same metrics. Hmm. We're adding, did it make a meaningful and measurable impact on this group we want to serve? But we're we're also kind of not really because if we're selecting for the right things, that's the springboard. And and to your point, it's not always there, but it is always worth thinking about and looking for. Um, sorry to run on, but I will I'll attack the most unpopular one that I think should be popular easily, and that's the Mayo, right? Like one thing that exists about Mayo is that you need to keep giving people new ideas of ways to use Mayo. And in a down market economy, helping them not throw away their leftovers by using Mayo and saying that that's purpose washing is just like, it, it boggles my mind because it's literally about having them buy more Mayo and use more Mayo. So that's why I just want to start challenging some of the people who are, they're not thinking with their biggest, most expansive, open minds on this stuff. <laughs> it makes sense. So I, I, the, the only other thing I was really intrigued about, and maybe you have to buy the book for this, is is what, what were the, are there any kind of, even just some beginning steps that, that, that you would recommend so that when companies want to, want to change and create strategies uh, that, that are more responsible, what are it? Have you got like a, a template or a playbook where you're like, yeah, you know, step one, look at this. One. As we all know, for doing great work, otherwise Greg Hahn would have been selling millions of them yeah. right now. <laughs> but there, but there are some key questions that I do have, even in the deck we'll share after this, um, to ask yourself. And and one of the ways to start identifying the right camps to think about, especially if you're a smaller business, is this idea of historical debt, whether it's your company or your industry, what, what has happened in the past that you played a role in? And the banking industry is a great example of, of one that's acting in this. Goldman has, um, you know, one million black women. City has action for racial equity. Carla Hassan from the CPG world created that. So it's really about solving those historical wrongs in ways that obviously it's not gonna get fixed overnight but you can talk about your commitment to it because you're actually doing it. Um, and, you know, let's think of, of a less lofty example, perhaps. I'm thinking about local sports, right? Let's say there's a township that wants to raise X amount for a bake sale, but they need also some equipment. So someone who may not have the same mobility, um, you know, uh, sort of natural tendencies as as his or her classmates um, to be involved. Using that as the reason for the fundraiser will raise more money for the entire team because everybody cares about that person being comfortable, right? And then you identify as the sort of people that we're the team that cares. That's branding, right? That and there's, and there's something real there that means something. 
much more than like, you know, her chocolate chips were more delicious than his chocolate chips were. Like there's always more. And, and you know, if we're going to be here on this earth, my take is why not find them more? I totally agree. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Chris. We'll uh, let Chris uh, go back in the background again now. <laughs> Thank you, Thank so, you much, so much, Chris. Oh, Chris you got me really, <laughs> really fired up. Those are great questions. That was fantastic. So the other thing I'd like to talk to you about is when we are, you know, one within the company and we're feeling that maybe our uh, passion, passion for this subject isn't felt by the rest of the team. You know, mm. we're, we're there in wherever in the meeting, like, I really want to go in this direction. And you're just not not getting buy in from from the rest of the team. There's no question it's the way we have to go, but not everyone's with the program. Yeah, have you got any advice in that sort of environment? Yeah, certainly. I mean, it, it goes back to the things we do to get buy in for anything that's not quite understood we nation build and we do it before the meeting way before and we get people to believe that they're part of the sort of pioneering of, of a way of doing things that people wouldn't expect from them i i mean we won't get into it but i have a lot of experience working very closely with people who you might consider i don't know a little more red state than me and, I, and I've never had a problem relating because at the end of the day, if you're curious about what a person believes, they will want to build with you. They will want to learn from you and about you. And you should want that from them authentically. It, it goes both ways. Like it took me a while when I first started working at PepsiCo to even process that as a 22 year old who just rolled out of bed at college, I'm now in a meeting with someone who has almost 40 years of research and development experience in labs. And he's teaching me his like, like, why do I deserve this? You know what I mean? And so your cross-functional partners need to feel that you really do believe that this is not going to come to life without not just their agreement, but their participation. And that's usually true. And uh, we're not going to finish this conversation, Lola, without talking about the honour we had this year of being at uh, Cannes Festival of Creativity. Fantastic source of so many great talks. We met so many amazing people over those over those days down there and do realise it's an honour to be in that environment. Maybe oh you'd like to tell us your experience of can and what your takeaways were any any insights into that week in the south of france well you know it's great because it was my third can actually in a row um and each one had been a different experience so i started with a very last minute followed by you know a, a dm plea um application to jim single cmo accelerator um that you know the, from the powers that be, I ended up being able to join that. And so my first experience was really curated and and uh, and a lot about meeting the sorts of people that um, I wanted to be doing more work, studying and sort of learning about. So that was really, really fortuitous. Um, and then the second year, I wanted to do a little bit more of dabbling of, you know, getting on stages of my own on the fringe. I did the female quotient did some other things. I really wanted to start establishing my voice, right? Um, and so that was great too. This third year, all of that kind of scaled to where, wow, I have a speaking engagement every day. Wow, my friend Miles invited me to talk about why we still use the word multicultural um, for to be his client. Like, so that level of trust. So just in those three years of building network, um, I've seen a tremendous... I don't, not to be dramatic, but transformation in the access um, and confidence I have with even as a solo practitioner who sort of, yes, works with contractors, but I haven't built a big team. I feel like I'm part of a team. And that's and that's things like, you know, the festival. It's also communities like if, you know, Lindsay Slavey, who built Sunday Dinner. Um, there are a lot of people who care about making sure marketers come together. Monday Night Mentorship is another one that everyone can join. 
um, that is just, I, I can't recommend enough. It's, it's, so it's really about looking for places where you can tap in and take that risk and say, I'm going to raise my hand and ask. And I might get a no. And I, and you get a lot of them. And so what? <laughs> How do you even take that first step, Lola, if there's people on the call are saying, oh, I've always wanted to be on a panel at such and such. I've always wanted to be on the jury at such and such. How do they even take that first step? Well, and this is where I do want to honor personality differences, right? Like, I can speak from my personality. That is very easy for me. The harder part for me is like, you want me to make the slides? Like, I thought we were just going to have a fun <laughs> talk. Like, you know, So it is really knowing yourself and knowing all of the tools you need to be the person who's going to be successful. So I have, you know, a collaborator of mine who I worked with, Adele, who like, she is the slide master. Like, she is the like, Lola's ideas, now they're on a page and they make sense. So I, when I need to work with her, I work with her. Maybe it can go both ways around. If you have that extroverted friend who's like, he fires off a DM without even thinking about it, ask them to write one for you. I do it all the time for my friends who don't want to write their own DMs. I love doing that. It's fun for me. So, so being willing to ask for help and knowing where you're weak and not judging yourself for that, I think is really, really key to start moving into that zone of genius. And it took me a long time. I'm children of Nigerian immigrants. I was supposed to be great at everything. Like I was supposed to be a surgeon and an artist and like Picasso, <laughs> you know, and an architect, like, you know, um, but you start to learn that when you're, in, when you're your own person, like, you know, the things you just may not want to admit them to yourself yet. The admission is, is, is where the power is. How important Lola is it to be getting in the right sort of circle of people? Something that was quite an eye opener to me this year is now Lola and I were in a, a WhatsApp group, but I think it's probably got about a thousand people in it now, but it was women at Cannes and it was absolutely fantastic. A really supportive and group. And um, I particularly noticed there that there were a lot of uh, women who uh, were working in PR and they mm -hmm. were sort of actively then working on behalf, you know, getting people, even whilst we were there, getting people on the panels saying if somebody maybe had had to drop out and uh, how important do you think it is to be in those sort of circles? I'm going to be honest with you. I wish it could be different. The quickest way to scale um, being seen for an idea a, th a, a thought partnership, because I hate that term, thought leadership, but whatever it is that you want to share into the world of, you know, marketing trades and whatever you want to call that, the most efficient pathway is a good PR agent. And I worked with one for two years. And I found her by asking someone who I admired, how are you getting all those ad week kits? And then she told me. And so then I hired her. Um, and after that two and a half years, you know, the relationships kind of naturally gravitated towards myself. We might work again on something else when it comes to the book. But yeah, I mean, people aren't just getting plucked from, you know, obscurity and lucky enough to say, hey, I want you to write this article in Ad Week. It's really got to be push. Um, and it's really got to be willingness to humble yourself and ask the question, hey, how did you do that? Mm -hmm. Or compliment the reporter. Hey, I love that story. If you need a source next time, I'm always available. Mm -hmm. And they always need sources. So just, it's 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 really, and this is, again, going back to responsible, it's service and it's real. It works because it's real. We're not making stuff up. We're helping each other. So we care about each other. So we do things for each other, you know? Like there's no magic to it. It's just, we have to kind of get back to the roots of what human relationships are and how they function. Mm -hmm. And we can't sit in rooms waiting for someone to like invite us to be in a human relationship with them. They're not coming. <laughs> well, you've given some really great insights today, Lola. And for the people who are on the call with us today, if you wanted them to take away, you know, two or three points that you think are just really like the key points, important points, talking about responsible marketing, what would you like them to leave this uh conversation with what would you like to go away from the call thinking oh yeah th these are the important points to think about 
Sure. I'm going to start with the one I just saw. I love that term, genuine reciprocity. Because again, we live in a culture where some of us, I mean, you know, I was raised in Pennsylvania. You almost, the, the idea of wanting reciprocity feels dirty, right? But this is business. So we've already decided that's what we're doing here. We, the marketing teams, we have got to get over the idea that we should be pretending the thing we did didn't do something that we, to be nice and, you know, polite. That's not our deal. So we need to let that go, right? And the reason why we're letting that go is in service of the work. Because if the work isn't known to have worked, it's going to get killed. So this isn't about being polite. This is about being strategic. So that's that's the one thing I would say. Don't overthink the sort of optics of what this stuff should look like. Be willing to disrupt those a little bit in service of the work. Um, you know, I think the last thing I would say is take those micro actions in your day to do something a little different that might invite someone a little different than you to the table. And I won't make it any more specific than that. If you can invite someone who's a little different than you to the table, what might happen? What might you learn? What might they learn? What, what might come of that? What empathy might you gain? You know, I, my sister is um, differently abled and like she's the most important teacher in my life. You know, like from her, I learned how to actually relate without all of the talk, talk, talk. She feels she's she's very talkative, too, but. She, she has a superpower that other people don't have. And, and when you don't mix, you don't find your, your superpower people. And, and, and that's what you really need, I think, to have both fulfilling business and, you know, personal friendship relationships. Mm. Now I sound like Scott Galloway. <laughs> <laughs> no, fantastic. That's extremely important. Something we're always saying we're in favor of, you know, other people in ad agencies have told me of, events they do where you know once a month they'd bring somebody in it had no relevance to anything really but who knows what idea you're going to take away from it so it's important for if nothing else for creativity but as you yeah. say for inclusivity of understanding other people we can't understand them if we're not with them so I mean that's how really I met important. Cindy Gallup mm. I, I I don't even know how many years I don't have enough fingers to count how many years ago that was but she came to Galloway's class she talked about her vision for Make Love Not Porn, which is now actually really happening. This was years ago. And she opened my eyes to the idea that I didn't have to, like, be Talbots to be on the stage. Like, oh. And that was completely random. She wrote the forward to my book. Congratulations. You know? I so, saw that. Fantastic. Thank you. And also, that was tell me, I had to psych myself up to ask for that one. That's the last <laughs> thing I'll say, too. This is important. This is really important. None of this is easy for me. Mm. Even showing up to speak to you, I get nervous. I'm I'm telling you the truth. Um, it never goes away. I think it means you care, um, but it's part of the process. So if nerves are what is holding you back, mm. I would push and maybe assess how you feel after. If you still hate it after, then maybe it's not for you. Um, but if you can push through the nerves and you feel like that was the right thing for you to do, um, it's worth it every time. Fantastic. Lola, it's been so lovely talking to you. There's a lovely comment there from, from Patrice there saying, love your courage. Okay. Thank you so much, Patrice. It's been lovely talking to you. We've talked about business and I think we've nearly sort of segued into a therapy session there. I'm really feeling quite empowered. I'm not qualified to give medical advice. <laughs> <laughs> so like, everyone look on even the, on, on even Lola's nervous so yeah, yeah yeah Ron is absolutely you know you've just got to bite the bullet and go for it so it's been so great chatting with you here Lola after we met in the summer it's lovely to see yes. you again Thanks and before so you hang up I just have to recognize Ramon Jose who actually did all of the uh footnotes in the book so I can't see her here and not celebrate her because um i still don't quite humanly understand how that was possible thank you ramon <laughs> no thank, thank you, thank you. So i love working on it <laughs> <laughs> thank you love thanks it. thanks so much for joining us thanks, thanks so all much of you for me. joining us i hope you've enjoyed our conversation here with lola i hope that there's something positive you're going to take away from this call and uh, do keep your eye out 
on uh, Forster Courses and my own LinkedIn post, Louise Ward, to let you know of other Q&As that are coming up when we hope you'll join us again. And see you again another time. Thanks so much, Lola. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you so much. So great meeting anyone. Thank you, Louise. Thank you so much for bringing us together. <laughs>